online lecture series that is part of the team year, the memory of Kandes Bok. In this team year, we investigate the many meanings that have been given to uh, Kandes Bok in the past 78 years and are still being given. In this fourth lecture, it focuses on the genocide of the Sinti and the Roma. Our guest is this evening is Dr. Carola Finks, and Carola is one of the leading experts on the genocide of the Sinti and Roma in the world. In her lecture, Dr. Finks looks at both the history and the prehistory of the genocide. And afterwards, we will talk about the memory of the genocide of the Sinti and Roma, the coming to terms with and remembering the genocide in Europe and especially in the Netherlands. For your information, this lecture will be recorded and later distributed via, via our social media channels for people who unfortunately cannot attend tonight. And of course, you can also ask questions yourself by posting them in the chat of this Zoom meeting. Corolla, can I give the floor to you? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the invitation and the very nice introduction. Uh, we agreed that I uh, will have a presentation roughly about 20 minutes and afterwards we will open the discussion. Uh, I'm very happy if there are also questions from the audience. So I just start with sharing my screen and go ahead. Well, the title is The Genocide of the Cynthia and Roma Research, Recognition and Remembrance. Can you see everything good? Yes. Okay, we see here the now iconic photograph of Anna Maria Steinbach called Settler, who was nine years old at the time. It is a snapshot from a film showing the deportation from Westerbork to the concentration and extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau on 16th May 1944. This photo is also the starting point for today's talk. Like no other, it can illustrate the three aspects that will be at the center of our discussion, the research on the genocide of the Sinti and Roma, the recognition of this genocide after 1945, and the development of the culture of remembrance. Now, let's take research. I have chosen three works here that in some ways illustrate turning points in historiography. In 1972, the destiny of Europe's gypsies appeared. This was the first attempt at an overall account of the persecution and murder of the European Sinti and Roma, 27 years after the end of the war. But not only this is remarkable, but also the context in which it was written. Both authors, Donald Kenrick and Gretchen Parkson, were active in the then emerging international Roma civil rights movement. The activist had recognized that the lack of recognition of the genocide was one of the reasons why racism against Sinti and Roma continued after 1945. The demand for recognition of the genocide was therefore one of the movement's central political goals. 20 years later, journalist Art Wagner set out to tell the story of the girl with the white headscarf. The film in which this scene appears had been taken in 1944 by the orders of the camp commandant of Westerbork by the Jewish filmmaker Rudolf Breslauer, a prisoner of the camp. Until 1995, when Wagner published the results of this extensive research, the girl was thought to be a Jewish child. His book illustrates how little interest there had been until then among researchers and the public to shed light on the persecution of Sinti and Roma. But it also shows that survivors and relatives had a lot of knowledge, but there were hardly any public spaces to share it. The discovery that the girl deported to an extermination camp was a Sintetsa was a turning point towards an acknowledgement of the genocide committed against Sinti and Roma. Michael Zimmermann's book marks another turning point, namely the beginning of academic research on the genocide. His postdoctoral thesis, published in 1996, paved the way for the subject of research to enter the universities like no other, even, even if it was to take several more years before it became more widely established. 
Why did it come so late? Why was no one interested in the fate of the Roma? The main reason was, of course, the long lasting anti Gypsyism. Actually, I should be showing completely different images at this point, namely the distorted images that have been spread about gypsies, gypsies in Europe, especially since the end of the 19th century. These would illustrate how people were degraded to objects. But to be honest, I don't want to spread these images because they always have their negative effect. The most sought after motives were those that presented Cynthia or Roma as wrecked and dirty in the wild, the perfect counter image to a bourgeois society. In paintings and soon also in photographs, Cynthia and Roma were ma made to savages, marked as strangers, labeled as nomads, and then also as criminals and associates. Only those photographs that established the alleged outsider position of Cynthia and Roma found their way into encyclopedias and scholarly works, ethnographic periodicals, and popular magazines. Anti-Gypsyism, which dates back to the late Middle Ages, had become more entrenched with the formation of nation states and the division of people into races. This red, racial biological attack on the minority was the foundation for the genocide. Yet Sinti and Roma were always part of the societies in which they lived. Of course, there was poverty and life in poor quarters, but a large part of the population at that time lived like that. There was a wide range of realities and lifestyles among Sinti and Roma. If you want to learn something about this, you have to take a look at the private photo albums. Here, for example, we see uh, members of the Bamberger family from Germany in the 1930s. Max, Max Bamberger, far right, was the victim of a massacre while fleeing in occupied Yugoslavia shortly before the end of the war. Margaret Bamberger from front left was later deported to Auschwitz. The Viennese Roma Stoika family is pictured with their friends also in the 1930s. The Stoikas were deported to Auschwitz in March 1943. In another private photo, we see Hungarian Roma around the beginning of the 20th century. We don't know the names or their further history. And then there is the Czech family here. The photo was taken before the deportation to Auschwitz. Of the once 10 member family, only three survived the camp. Once again, why so late? The perpetrators were of central importance here because they succeeded in two respects after 1945. They were able to continue their careers and successfully spread the thesis that Sinti and Roma had been persecuted as criminals and not for racial reasons. This turned the victims into the guilty. Perpetrators were almost without exception not punished. This could only be succeeded because the courts and the public shared these positions. So-called gypsies were not to be full citizens even after liberation and the exclusion continued. We see here some of the relevant perpetrators. On the left, the employees of the Reichszentrale zur Bekämpfung des Zigeunerunwesens of the Reich Criminal Police Office. They were pictured on the occasion of a service anniversary in May 1942. From 1938 onwards, the Reich Central Office under Heinrich Himmler was largely responsible for organizing the persecution up to and including the deportations to Auschwitz. Together with Robert Ritter, whom you can see in the color photo on the right, and who headed the Rassenhygienische und Bevölkerungsbiologische Forschungsstelle, they formed what Michael Zimmermann calls the scientific police complex. Ritter provided the ideological and practical preconditions for the genocide. Neither the Kripo officials nor anyone from the Rassenhygienische Forschungsstelle was prosecuted after 1945. High-ranking officials such as Hinrich Lose, the third from the right in the photo below right, also got off cheaply. Lose was Reichskommissar Kommissar Ostland in Riga, and one of the main persons responsible for the shootings of Jews and Roma in the occupied Baltic states. 
Although he was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 1947, he was released from prison at the beginning of 1951 due to illness. He died in 1964. The only perpetrator convicted of crimes against Sinti and Roma in Auschwitz is Ernst August König, shown in the middle photo on the left. He had been Blockführer in Auschwitz-Birkenau and was brought to trial in 1987 thanks to the initiatives of the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma. In early 1991, he was sentenced to life imprisonment for multiple murder. He evaded imprisonment by committing suicide. Thanks to the civil rights movements, the genocide received more attention since the 1970s. Milestones for its perceptions by an international public were the opening of the permanent exhibition on the persecution of the Sinti and Roma in the Auschwitz Memorial in 2001, and the inauguration of the Memorial to the Sinti and Roma of Europe murdered under National Socialism in Berlin in 2012. Academic research has also intensified since the 1990s, but the quality, the breadth and the depth of the state of research are extremely heterogeneous for European countries. The existing knowledge is highly fragmented and often only accessible by remotely published literature. In 2020, I therefore started the project Encyclopedia of the Nazi Genocide of the Sinti and Roma in Europe. It aims to collect, structure, and publish our knowledge about the genocide. It is based, it is based at Heidelberg University and funded by the German Federal Foreign Office. Currently, a team of more than 50 researchers, Bas Kortold is one of them, is working on the encyclopedia, which will contain more than 1,000 lemmas. These lemmas include information about spaces, uh, the crime scenes all over Europe, the persecution system, various topics, and several life paths from Sinti and Roma, and of course, about the aftermath. The first results will be available online in German and English at the end of this year, and the printed version in German will also be available at the end of 2025. Here you see a map that the Documentation and Cultural Center of German Sinti and Roma created for the permanent exhibition at the Auschwitz Memorial. It illustrates the persecution measures in the German Reich, the German occupied countries, and in the states collaborating with Germany. Even though the encyclopedia is far from being finished, it can already be said that it will create a new map of the crimes committed against Sinti and Roma. In the following, I would like to present three major complexes of crimes that are essential to the genocide of Sinti and Roma and can be found in different dimensions everywhere in Europe. First of all, there is the segregation from the rest of the population. In Germany, from 1935 until the beginning of the war, about half of the Sinti and Roma were locked up in detention camps. Here we see the camp in Cologne, where at times several hundred people had to live. There was also a network of detention camps in German-occupied France, whereby the incarceration of Roma and Sinti had already been ordered before the German invasion. In the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, there were two large detention camps that had the character of concentration camps, Leti in Bohemia and Odonin in Moravia. In Austria, Roma and Sinti too were forcibly sent to camps. Lakenbach was the largest and also the cruelest of them. Separate camps for Roma existed at different times almost everywhere in the German sphere of power. However, other forms of restriction of freedom of movement and imprisonments are also known. For example, detention, house arrest, especially in France, and banishment, which was practiced in Italy. Segregation was followed by deportation to concentration camps, ghettos, or extermination camps. Since 1938, several thousand men and then also women were deported to concentration camps. We see here Austrian Roma 
who were deported to Buchenwald via Lakenbach and the Dachau concentration camp. Systematic deportations of entire families began from the German Reich in May 1940. Around two and a half thousand Sinti and Roma were deported to occupied Poland. In autumn 1941, 5,000 Austrian Roma from Burgenland were deported to the Litzmannstadt ghetto, more than half of them children. None of them survived. Those who had not already died in the ghetto were murdered in gas vans in the Kulmuf extermination camp at the end of 1941 to the beginning of 1942. In the fascist independent state of Croatia, Roma were systematically deported to Jasinovac camp and murdered there. Around 16,000 names of those murdered have since been identified. Romania drove about 25,000 Roma across the Bug River to Transnistria in 1942. More than half of them did not survive. In February 1943, now exactly 80 years ago, the deportations of the Sinti and Roma to the concentration and extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau began. More than 22,000 people were deported from the Reich, Austria, the Protectorate, from occupied Poland, and then in 1944 from the occupied countries of Belgium and Northern France, and as well from the Netherlands. Around 90% of the deportees did not survive. This overview only includes the large systematic deportations. In addition, there were repeated deportations of individuals or smaller groups to concentration and extermination camps. It should also be remembered that cruel medical crimes were committed against Sinti and Roma in the concentration camps and that Sinti and Roma were also victims of forced sterilization and so-called euthanasia. The map of crimes includes hundreds of sites where Sinti and Roma were killed on the spot. For German occupying Poland alone, 180 killing sites are known where smaller or larger groups of Roma and Sinti were shot. The crime scenes in the German occupied Soviet Union are far from being fully recorded. We see here a map by our colleague Mikhail Tiagli, who has identified around 140 killing sites of Roma in German occupied Ukraine alone. In German occupied Serbia, Roma were victims of the infamous hostage killings by the thousands. By the thousands. For every German soldier injured or killed in the war, the military commander had 50 or 100 prisoners designated as hostages shot. These were mostly Jews, but also Roma. The genocide of the, Ro of the Sinti and Roma was predominantly carried out outside camps. Many of these crimes, which were committed mainly in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe, have not yet been clarified. Little attention has been paid so far to the crimes committed in the last months of the war against smaller groups or individuals in the West, for example, in German-occupied France or Italy. To conclude my presentation, I would like to address a topic that is essential to the discourse of remembrance. For decades, the former perpetrators dominated the discourse on the genocide of the Sinti and Roma. It is thanks to the commitment of the survivors and their descendants that this is no longer the case today. The online edition, Voices of the Victims, whose homepage you can see here, was created within the framework of Rome Archive, the international digital archive of the Sinti and Roma. The focus is on written testimonies about the genocide from the perspective of those affected, mostly written during the time of persecution or immediately afterwards. For the Netherlands, three sources are presented there. They are shown as scans, as transcripts and in translations, and they are made audible. We will listen to one of these sources. 
Petrus Johannes Voss. Esteemed Lord Mayor. Herewith, by request, esteemed sir, if you could be so kind to provide information about the Weiss family who lived at 85 Lachmaser. The family was transported to Germany on the 16th of May, 1944, and we haven't heard from them since. Please understand that we are the parents of Mrs. Weiss and we would be grateful to hear if they are still alive. The oldest son is with us, and he is longing for his parents. The oldest son referred to is Zoni Weiss. Parents and both siblings were deported from Westerberg to Auschwitz and murdered. Zoni Weiss has been one of the most important voices of the survivors since his memorial speech in the German Bundestag on 27 January 2011. Now, if time still permits. It was your. Oh, and I think it permits. <clears throat> I would like to point out the growing importance of the memorial literature, from the first conversations and interviews since the 1980s to the biographies and autobiographies of individual survivors, impressive testimonies are now available. The second generation is also speaking out. Anyone who wants to know something about the horrific effects of persecution and the devastating impact of denied recognition after 1945 on survivors and subsequent generations should turn to such testimonies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carola, for this, for this superb overview. Uh, coming from the Netherlands and working in the Netherlands, like, like a lot of people I think that, that are here today, it's very easy to focus only on your own country's perspective. And it's harder to see, okay, this is not only in the Netherlands, it was everywhere in Europe, and especially the maps you showed, I think gave us a, a, a superb overview that uh, the deportation and killing of thousands and thousands and thousands of Sinti and Roma happened everywhere in Europe. Uh, throughout a lot of a lot of countries. Now, uh, I've written down some questions for you from the from the uh, uh, points you you made. You can say, and looking, for example, at the Dutch history of the Sinti and Roma, uh, it's quite easy for people to say, okay, uh, anti gypsyism started in 1940 when the Nazis invaded uh, mm -hmm. the Netherlands, and it ended in 1945. But of course, uh, it's just like anti-Semitism, it's for ages and centuries, it's been here in, in our country. And looking at the laws implanted by the Nazis, a lot of those laws in, implanted in the Netherlands were laws that people were thinking about, politicians were thinking about even before the war. And some of these laws were, again, not taken back, were still implemented in the 50s and in the 60s. Yes. Uh, for example, the travel bans you had in the Netherlands it was a Nazi law, but in 1950 and 1960, it was still there. And nowadays you can say it's still there. Uh, how was this in, in other countries? Or was it the same? Was it, okay, a lot of ideas before the war, the Nazis invaded and they took the ideas and, and after the war, still those laws were, were there? Well, I, I think it's an, uh, it's a, it was everywhere in Europe. And as I tried to, to, to make clear in my second or third uh, uh, presentation part, um, it, it, it was, we had it since the Middle Ages. Uh, there were different um, aspects, there were religious aspects, there were social aspects and so on. But in the 19th century, it really was very much focused on the question of race, of belonging and not belonging to society. And it was somehow to expel gypsies was part of the nation building process in the 19th century. And this affected nearly all, definitely all countries in, in Europe. But there is a difference um, 
with respect to the question how deep this racial ideology was rooted in the societies. And in Germany, we see um, that there were, uh, was a, a huge power that led to the fact that um, the state had a policy that was based on race in 1933. And this made the difference. But um, for all European countries, especially since the 19th century, the group of gypsies was the perfect group to, for, to establish an own national identity and to say, these are the strangers and, and we are one nation I don't, and they don't belong to us. And we have several kinds of laws in diverse countries. And we also see that there was a pan-European movement, especially within the bureaucracy of the criminal police. Um, one of the main topics by the emerging Interpol was, uh, were gypsies. This was one of the main topics. Uh, and what we see in the life stories of Sinti and Roma families, they were very often driven from one country to the other. We know this definitely also for the Netherlands. There was huge exchange of people between Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, France, Luxembourg. And, and one of the participants uh, wrote in the chat that uh, looking at the background, the the original origin, you can say, of the Sinti and Roma, and she asked me, uh, "Whom uh, Sintu? It just sounds like an, an Indian word." And I, I, I think you will know, just that I know, that one of the stories that came from the Sinti and Roma themselves is that they say, "Okay, we're from India." Uh, in how far is that the case? We know the oral history, but looking at scientific evidence, uh, do we know where they they came from, or is it? Uh, uh, only the story that we know coming from the Sinti and Roma. No, no, no. Definitely, we know, uh, uh, and we have this knowledge mainly gathered from linguists uh, that the Romani, the language that uh, most Roma speakers spoke, uh, has uh, this this Indian um, well elements there and uh, from there on we know that uh, roughly around uh, the year 1000 there was uh, migration of Roma to Europe uh, and then in the Middle Ages since the 13th and 14th century they settled all over Europe uh, but we can see that um, within the 15th, 16th and 17th century, Roma were settled in their countries. Um, linguists found out that uh, people have regional dialects that hint to the fact that they have been settled there for uh, decades. So um, the, the saying that they are of Indian origin is always or quite often a technique to, to make them to strangers. Um, so, and if we look at the history of mankind, uh, do you know where your ancestors came from? So um, this doesn't play a role after 100, 200, 300 or 400 years. It shouldn't play a role, but it play, in, in this respect, it plays always a role. True, and I think that, uh looking also at the first question asked you and uh, the second question uh, after the war when the Sinti and Roma came back in the Netherlands uh, not only from the government perspective they were the laws like, like we talked about they were discriminated but also in the small villages they were seen as strangers still after hundreds of years living in the Netherlands they were seen as a, a socials and even within the wartime uh, there was one big razzia, of course, in the Netherlands in 1944, and was left up to the mayors and of the policemen in the Netherlands to say, okay, who is a gypsy, who is not a gypsy. Uh, and I think that played a big role in, in uh, anti-gypsyism also after the war, 
And uh, not only the laws were still there, but a lot of times the policemen who took the Sinti and Roma in May 1944 were still working at mm -hmm. the camps in 1946 and in 1947. And I think this also in the Netherlands had a huge effect on, on remembrance culture, uh, because from the 1940s, within the Sinti and Roma community, it was said, don't talk about it and don't talk to about it to strangers. One of the reasons is that they were scared that it would come back and people would hunt them again. Um, another reason is that in the Netherlands, especially in the south part of the Netherlands, within the Sinti culture, it is said that uh, don't talk about people who are not here anymore. Don't talk about the murdered or deceased people. Uh, let them have their rest. And I had a good conversation with, and, and she died uh, sadly, but with Mike Steinbach, uh, a niece you can say of Settler Steinbach. And she always told me that within the Jewish community, it is said that if your name is still being read out, if you're partly alive. And she said, yeah, Settler gets so much attention, she doesn't get her rest. Uh, how do you look at that? Is this also one of the, the reasons that uh, still, like Sony Wise says, the, the, the Sinti and Roma genocide is the forgotten Holocaust and, and are there other reasons why it is still in the shadow of other historical events? And what is your perception on this? Well, I think first of all, uh, to tell uh, such a story, a story of extreme humiliation uh, you need um, trust. And definitely the Sinti and Roma, the survivors couldn't trust the society because still the perpetrators were active. They made, as I said, their careers. They were still in charge and they decided again about what happens to the Sinti or Roma and what happens to the survivors. They were not recognized. They have not been compensated um, for their losses uh, and so on. So, so, so this is um, understand, understandable. But on the other hand, well, I was, um, there is this wonderful website, um, sintiromagenocide.eu. Uh, it is made by the um, National Committee 3rd and 5th May. Uh, it is. It went was published in 2012, as far as I remember. And uh, the in the years before, I took part in several meetings when this the concept was made for this website. And in these meetings, quite often took took place in in the Netherlands. I I had the impression that even at that time, there was no idea of who the people were who had been affected by the deportation from Westerbork. And, and definitely, uh, I always thought, well, the, well, the city <coughs> in the Netherlands is so small. You have 247 people that had been deported to Auschwitz. Why don't you know what happened to each of these persons? And why don't you know anything about these families? In the beginning of, it was in 2008, 9, 10, something around that. And I was a little bit astonished that there was not a stronger movement. Uh, in, 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 in definitely not uh, under scientists and only there were a few, yes, but we had, did not get any impression about the personal stories. And there was also not such a visible movement of Sinti or Roma. I think that changed a lot in the last 10 years. And I think it would be interesting to talk about why it's, it started so late in, in the Netherlands. I, 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 find, I found this very, very obvious. And, and if, you did, if you compare that, for example, to, to your own country, to Germany, uh, was there a force, for example, in Germany that said, okay, let's, Let's work on it. You have the center, of course, in Heidelberg. What kind yes. of role did that play? Yes, yes, definitely. I think that's a, that's a huge difference. Uh, there was a, a, a strong community in Germany that fought since the end of the war. With uh, in the beginning of the war, the, this were uh, uh, right after the war. These were only a handful of people, 
but but starting in the beginning of the 70s, also uh, with this you know spirit of the international Romani movement, they got stronger and stronger, and they were really deeply worked on the question of recognition and compensation and also on remembrance. And without this movement, we wouldn't have anything that is um, now seen in the public, like the memorial in Berlin. Uh, so, so this was a difference, and they definitely forced society to think about this history, to discuss about this history, and to do something uh, in respect of research, remembrance, and also compensation. Uh, but on the other hand, it was not only the civil rights movement of the Sinti and Roma themselves. There were always supporters on their side that were committed to this topic and fought with them. So um, I, I, I can't explain what happened in your country there in this oh, respect, but it was so obvious. That yeah. uh, and and also I think there was also also a little bit the ten the tendency to say oh these were all strangers these were the people that had been deported they were only refugees from some other countries that were no Dutch people true true and I think that uh, knowledge nowadays. Uh, on, the, there's, on the one hand, there's more interest in the topic. I think we can talk about it uh, sometime later. But on the other hand, and I think you all also see this uh, with the Holocaust in general, uh, that knowledge about what happened is, is getting less in the sense that a lot of people in the Netherlands know the word, for example, uh, Sigeuner, uh, uh, Gypsy, 10, 15 years ago. And nowadays, if we talk about Sinti and Roma in Westerbork, with children, for example, then they don't know often what Sinti and Roma are. And then you say, okay, they used to be called uh, Gypsy, Sigeune. And 10, 15 years ago, people would know, okay, now I know. And nowadays, even that word, we don't use it, of course, anymore, is not well known anymore. And, and people uh, don't relate, don't have knowledge about it. And uh, uh, because nobody from that culture maybe lives in their own town but also because uh, uh, of course you've shown books that have been coming out in the last couple of years but there are only a few books within the big amount of books that come out of course about the holocaust about the, the, the Sinti in Roma and about the genocide but I believe it's a little bit changing like you said I think mm -hmm. one of the reasons for this is that uh, also from the Sinti and Roma community themselves, from the third generation, you can say a lot of in initiatives have come forward, say, OK, uh, this is not how it should be. And we have to uh, have information about this. We have to have more shedding light on, on, on what happened. And I think that's very important that, um, uh, that academics, uh, that uh, educational workers, school teachers talk about it together with Sinti and Roma. Uh, how is this uh, in, in other countries in, in Europe? How, except for Germany, uh, how is how, how people, how is being talked about this, sub this subject? How uh, on schools, etc. Uh, can you shed a, a light a little bit on that? Is this a big topic in other countries or is it just the same in the like in the Netherlands? Oh, it, is, it, is, it differs definitely from country to country, and it depends. Um, first, uh, I think what, what is very important is whether there is an active work in the memorial sites. And I think, therefore, that Westerberg is a, is a key place for this question. Um, well, we see now, for example, in, in, um, <clears throat> in the Czech Republic, uh, there had been a horrible debate for years and years about uh, the former Leti camp where there was a pig farm after 45. And it took, took years and years uh, until this, this uh, former campsite was rebought by the state. And now they are going to establish a memorial site there. 
And there you see that there had been uh, various groups of activists, not only Roma, but foundations and so on, but they had to fight for a very long time. And when you, uh, when you achieve such places, like for example, the documentation center in Heidelberg or the Roma Museum in Brno uh, or other places that are, are dedicated to this remembrance, like the, the museums at the former concentration camp sites or the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris, for example, um, they, they, they care for this topic and they make events, they make regular events, and this is, I think, I think one of the most important things. And uh, let's 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 look, for example, at countries like Norway. Uh, we know that no deportations took place from Norway, but it plays there also a role in the remembrance culture because of two things. The one thing is that there was a group of roughly thirty persons, Norwegian Roma who had been expelled at the border from to Denmark. Uh, they were not allowed to cross Denmark to go back to Norway in 1934. And what happened to these people? They were expelled uh, and then they were um, incarcerated in Belgium and via Mechelen, they were deported to Auschwitz and most of them killed there. So, uh, but there now in the last years, uh, some kind of remembrance started there that there were ancestors of these families, um, descendants of these families uh, that were interested in this story and the center in Oslo, they did research on this topic. So this is how the topic comes back to the country and they try to integrate it now in various formats, be it school, be it museums, exhibitions, talks, and so on. On the other hand, we, we, we see that there's a Euro Europeanization of remembrance and people who, let's say, for example, families who um, after 45 stranded in Germany or were, were liberated in German camps and then immigrated to other countries especially, for example, let's say, let's talk about Sweden. Uh, they bring with them their stories. They bring with them their family history. And I'm sure that also in the Netherlands, not only the descent the, of the families that had been deported in 44, or that had been imprisoned somehow uh, in that time, uh, live in the Netherlands, but also uh, the families who have stories of persecution in other European countries. And they bring this history with them and they want to have this history acknowledged and recognized. So, so this is also, think, I think, a very important topic for future remembrance to integrate these stories the people bring with them. True, I think that looking at the Sinti and Roma community nowadays in the Netherlands, it exists partly of the Sinti that were there already in, in 1930, 1940, even within the 19th century and the 18th century, some of them, uh, of, the, of their, their families, you can say, but a lot of them were came to the Netherlands in, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s from the Balkan or from Czech Czechoslovakia or from a lot of countries. And, and again, the, sto the stories that I hear uh, go about, talk about Westerbock, of course, but they also talk about Yasenovac, they talk about Letty. So um, in that sense, it's not, it's even a European story within the Netherlands, you can say. And I think this accounts for a lot of countries. Uh, touching back on what you presented, and of course, you talked also about Settela, uh, which is the history of Westerbork. Yes. Uh, and you talked about Ad Wagenaar coming out in the 90s saying, okay, uh, the unknown girl, which in a lot of places in the Netherlands was unknown, but not within the Sinti and Roma community, is, is Settela and she's a, a Sintasasi, she has a Sinti background. And that played a huge role in the Netherlands, I think, uh, about, okay, talking about the, the Sinti and Roma, but also talking from the Sinti and Roma and Sinti and maybe Roma. with should be also important. Yeah, and not again, from and about, but also with. 
Yeah, and I think this was important that at the same time we started with commemorations in, in Westerbork. Uh, even before that, Karl Stoika had an exhibition at, at Westerbork in 89, I believe. Uh, but this was the most important fact, uh, one of the most important reasons why from the 1990s, every couple of years, there was a big commemoration with a lot of Sinti and Roma. How important is Settela uh, outside of the Netherlands? How big of a symbol is she for the Sinti and Roma genocide in, in the whole of Europe? Yeah, it's one of the most important figures uh, if you talk about the history of Sinti and Roma, the genocide of Sinti and Roma, because this story of, of the not, not known history and then uh, finding out that this, this girl is a, is a Sinti girl is, is so telling about what happened after 45. That this, like, like Sony Weiss said, it is a forgotten Holocaust. And, and also this, um, well, definitely in um, the awareness of, of the Holocaust is very closely connected to wagons and deportation. And, and this combination is very strong to, to see a person in a wagon where you know this wagon starts to an extermination camp. And, and, and this is somehow, a dignifying situation, some, something this which makes you think about the brutality behind this murder and and the, the small girl that can't do anything against this and we know today what happened. So this is a very strong picture in itself. And um, if you if you look for a satellite in the internet, you will find hundreds of websites <laughs> where this photograph is used or where the story is, is told. Yeah. And, and I think one of the uh, things that came out of this, okay, this is satellite moment, you can say, is that, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, filmmakers like Bob Entrop, but also Sherry Downs, who made a film about Settela came forward and, and started collecting also oral history interviews and, and other kinds of interviews with Sinti and Roma. And uh, looking at the Netherlands, it's looking at historical events, you can say that a lot of times there are way more written sources than oral history sources. But in this case, I would say that we have probably more oral history information, video, uh, audio information, than, than written sources. Um, how is this in, in other countries? Is, is, is that, um, how, how is it divided? Is there a lot of archive material about this topic that we can use? Well, uh, it, it, uh, I think it is very much more difficult to find archival material about the genocide of Sinti and Roma, and especially documents from the hand of um, the perspective of uh, the persecuted. This is really difficult. Um, there is not a, such a long lasting tradition in writing and literature as we have it in the Jewish history. So this definitely is, is a problem. And therefore, um, well, there are in, 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 the, in the recent years, there are a lot of uh, efforts to look at the families as transmitters of the histories. There is a lot of knowledge within the families and this is highly important uh, together. And of course, well, uh, if I look on the, it depends definitely from country to country because here in Germany, we have thousands of files from the compensation after 45. And in these files, we have a lot of very detailed uh, stories that are told there. Um, uh, and you have, for example, for Romania, you have hundreds and thousands of petitions that were written uh, from Roma that had been deported to Transnistria. 
Uh, and in these petitions, they also describe their situation. But definitely, it is uh, much harder to do research on the genocide of the Sinti and Roma than do research on the Holocaust, because there we have uh, millions of documents from, from the hand of the people that had been persecuted. Yes, and, 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 and I think that, that uh, here you can um, compare the two iconic girls you have in the Netherlands. On the one hand, um, you have Anna Frank with her diary and a lot of sources around her. And on the other hand, you have Settela and the knowledge about her was hidden in the families. So this is somehow, I would say, um, it, it's, it shows how the situation in general is. It is difficult. But also as the, the book of Art Wagner and the story, stories that followed show, uh, it is not impossible to find things out. And, and I think this is my, my last question. Uh, because again, uh, Sony Weiss, uh, we've seen the letter of his, uh, of his grandfather, of course, you let us hear it, hear it, and he always talks about the forgotten Holocaust. How can we change this? What is the, the way forward? How can we get more research, more education, more people coming forward? And uh, I believe that especially in this topic, and we've talked about it, uh, that it, of every topic of the Holocaust, this has probably the most international links, even within wartime, because the, the, the older sister of Settela was taken from Belgium, uh, from Dosen, and, and I think this is true with a lot of families in, in Europe. Yes. Is this the way forward, one of the ways forward, to really uh, work together in an international per perspective and and other other ways how how should we proceed do you think yes well i, I think that uh, um, the international collaboration is is one of the key uh, situations we have here we we have to work international internationally we have to exchange our knowledge uh, about the persecution this does not only relate to the history of the persecuted, but also to the history of the perpetrators. We know, for example, that one of the criminal police officers who had been responsible for the deportation of the people of the Roman city in Hamburg in 1940, he later worked uh, in the camp in Leti. And uh, we already discussed this, uh, um, who were the key figures for the persecution in the Netherlands? Who was responsible in the German apparatus and who was responsible from the side of the Netherlands uh, population? So I think there are still a lot of questions to solve and uh, there are a lot of questions we can only solve in an international exchange on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think there are two other important things to do. The one is to go into the archives. And uh, as far as I know, uh, not yet everything um, is researched in the Netherlands, in the local archives. There are a lot of information about the families, where they lived, uh, what they, what kind of professions they had and so on. Um, and also, and the, the third thing is um, really to find formats and situations where uh, the families, uh, as far as they are interested, um, can work together with historians um, or researchers on the memorial site in order to establish regular formats of remembrance um, or other formats that could spread the history. I, yeah, I think you are totally right in the sense that uh, Yehuda Bauer, of course, one of the leading his historians on the Holocaust in the world, always said, countries also look at your own 
perpetrators and it's quite easy to say it, were, it was only the, the Germany, it was only the Nazis, but especially also on this topic, we know that in the Netherlands, the Razzias, it was the Dutch police when, and it was the mayors in, in, the, in the cities here that were there, that took the Sinti and Roma from their from their uh, living areas and took them to Westerbork. And I think this is not only important for the history, but also for the memory of the history in the Netherlands. And it's uh, the way the relationship between the government nowadays in the Netherlands and local governments and national government and the Sinti and Roma partly comes from this and partly comes from the enormous distrust that is, of course, uh, normally this is completely normal that but it comes from wartime and it comes from so it has an effect on on Sinti and Roma nowadays and I think this is very important to give that context also that it wasn't only it wasn't only the Germans the Nazis who did this it was us it was also the Dutch it was our grandfathers it was our uh, grandparents you can uh, you can say and of course, I again, I think that academic research will never be finished. So it's very <laughs> important to really look for your archives, look for the local archives and really dig into the histories that are there. And like you said, on the other hand, the last remark, uh, give space and give room for the Sinti and Roma themselves to create things uh, on their own turf, on their own way. OK, this is how we want to talk about our own past and uh, what we do in Westerbork every time is work together with Sinti and Roma not talk about but talk with Sinti and Roma I think this is very very important yes Carola thanks incredibly for your insights for the sharing of your insights uh, like I said earlier uh, sometimes it's very easy to only look from your own very narrative view as, as a Dutchman uh, but getting insight in, in how it is in, in Europe is, is, is very valuable, I would, uh, I would say. So, so thank you. Uh, uh, this brings us to the end of this fourth lecture on the memory of Cam Westerbork. So everybody at home, thank you for your attendance. The next month, of course, there will be a new lecture. And the topic of this lecture will be perpetrator heritage and our memory in dealing with this perpetrator heritage. And our guest, the speaker, will then be Rob van der Laase, who holds the so-called Westerbock chair at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Carola, thank you again. And everybody at home, thank you for your attendance and maybe see you next time. So thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>